Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope all of you are doing well and in high spirits. My name is Willie, and I will be moderator for today's event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you to the Ask Ambassador Anything session with His Excellency Peter Skuf, Ambassador of Germany to Indonesia. Our event today is a part of the Europe Virtual Talks Road to Europe Day 2021 that we are holding throughout the year. Uh, I'm sorry, throughout the, uh, this week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Europe Day is a celebration of peace and unity in Europe that is celebrated every 9th of May. Every year, the European Union institutions in Europe and its offices all over the world organize a number of activities for people of all ages to mark the day and raise awareness about the EU. Despite not being able to celebrate the Europe Day uh, in a traditional physical manner this year, FBCI is delighted to work together with the delegation of the European Union in Jakarta in convening the Europe Virtual Talks Europe, uh, Road to Europe Day 2021, starting from May 1st to May 8th. This series acts as a platform for the Indonesian public to directly interact and converse with ambassadors or representative of 10 European countries to gain further knowledge and insights about Europe, the EU, and its member states. So today, uh, we are joined by His Excellency Peter Skuf, Ambassador of Germany to Indonesia. His Excellency has prepared a very special presentation for us and is ready to answer as many questions as he can from the YouTube live chat box. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for joining today. Uh, I hope you are doing well. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, we are also joined by students from FPCI chapters across Indonesia and the general public who are tuning in live on FPCI's YouTube channel. So thank you for participating and welcome everybody. Before we move further, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to encourage all uh, audience to stay tuned until the end of this virtual talks, uh, because we will be having a quiz where you can win fun prizes from the European Union. You can use your order confirmation number, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on your Eventbrite ticket that has been sent to you through email to register for the quiz on Kahoot later on. So make sure to stay tuned for that. Uh, we also encourage you to share your moments with us uh, from this virtual talks by tagging at FPCindo and at uni underscore Europa using the hashtag eu for you and Europe Day 2021 on your social media post. We also encourage you to ask the ambassador anything uh, via YouTube live chat box. Uh, our committee will pick out the best questions and I will be reading them out to Ambassador uh, Peter. Uh, please remember to keep your questions positive, constructive, and concise. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin our discussion today. Without further ado, I would like to invite Ambassador Peter Skouf to deliver his remarks. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Sorry, Ambassador, you are still on mute. <laughs> please, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Sorry, I'm... I'm discreet. So <laughs> again, uh, thank you very much to everybody. I'm very happy to be with you this morning to speak a little bit about um, uh, Germany and the German um, embassy and the, the relations between the um, Indonesia and, um, and, and Germany. Um, well, by way of introduction, Germany, I, I'm, I trust that most of you are aware with our basic parameters, um, um, a country is always a very complex entity. Let me pick out a couple of um, a, a couple of um, very important parameters that describe my country. Um, we are the um, in Euro in the European Union. We are the we are the biggest country in terms of population, not in size, but in population, 81 um, million um, uh, people. Uh, we are the country in Europe with the highest number of neighbors. We are surrounded by nine neighbors, uh, by France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Denmark, Poland, the Czech Republic, Austria, and Switzerland. So no other country has as many neighbors as we. So we have to deal with lots of uh, issues. Um, we are a country, as you know, with a special history, uh, which has not been very glorious, uh, having uh, triggered uh, two world wars in the last century. So. Uh, as a lesson and result uh, of this, uh, we are um, we find our destiny um, as members and part of the European Union, and we see the European Union as the main 
uh, objective to maintain peace, stability, prosperity uh, uh, in, in, in Europe, um, unlike in the centuries before. And that is why we are probably the only country in Europe which has the commitment to European integration, actually to progressive European integration written in the preamble of its constitution. So that is a, a very important um, feature of our country. We are a country that has evolved into a very open society. Few people know that uh, out of the 81 million Germans that live in Germany, there are about 20, 21 or 22 million by now who have a background, a migratory background, a migration background, be it that they have been born themselves in another country and came to Germany later, or that their parents came to Germany. That's how we define it. So that is easily overlooked. So that is also the, the one of the reasons why in Germany you have, uh, when you look back at the last, um, um, well, big refugee situation in 2015. You have in Germany the country which more than any other country in in, um, in Europe has um, has admitted the refugees from the Middle East, uh, from Syria mainly, one million people at the time. A lot of this has to do with our own history and also with the fact that we have uh, this specific um, share of uh, uh, migration, I mean, uh, com compatriots with a, with a background in migration. Um, let me then say we are, um, you know, in Europe you find countries uh, whose economic base is in industry and manufacturing, you find countries who, whose base is in uh, services industries, you find countries whose base is in agriculture, and uh, of course we are known to be the country of manufacturing and of technology. Uh, with a, I think, still a good brand name internationally, with our with our uh, products made in Germany and our main companies that have um, a good reputation worldwide, um, and uh, we are a country of football. <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> this is our our main uh, <laughs> national uh, sport still, and everybody. Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, there's people who say Germany is divided between uh, West and East Germany. Um, uh, I would say Germany is divided by the fans of Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund. Uh, <laughs> I will disclose if anybody wants to know where I am, but I will leave it up for the quiz to, to, um, uh, to, to, um, to, to, for you to guess. So that's Germany. So um, we are, let me just say a couple of words about the, the embassy. Um, we are a big embassy compared to other European uh, uh, member states here. We have about uh, roughly 100 uh, colleagues. We cover Indonesia, of course. This is our main, um, main accreditation, if, if, if I may say so. But we also cover ASEAN. We are the, the German mission to ASEAN. Um, to ASEAN, by the way, it's important for us because we are a development partner of uh, ASEAN together with four other countries that ASEAN has chosen as development partners. So we have a big portfolio uh, in cooperation with ASEAN. And uh, we also cover Timor-Leste uh, from, from Jakarta. So that's um, three, <laughs> three, um, three jobs that we, we have to do. Um, the embassy has about, as I said, 100 uh, colleagues of which of whom I would say don't Nail me down, but I think about 40 to 45 people are Germans and uh, 50 or 55 people are Indonesian colleagues. Um, we, um, as an embassy, uh, we, the role of an embassy, I think, is uh, I don't have to describe to you. It, is, uh, it has a number of um, uh, known um, objectives. We are supposed here to, 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 um, to analyze and to report on Indonesia and ASEAN and Timor Leste from here to our headquarters in Berlin and uh, keep our government abreast of uh, the situation in Indonesia. Uh, the second is we are here to, of course, facilitate and network um, on a bilateral level. Uh, and um, I will say, I will say in, a, in, a, in a minute a couple of things about the bilateral portfolio. Um, but we are also here to, and this is increasingly important to um, 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 as partners to advance our cooperation in the not so much the narrow bilateral uh, agenda, but more on the global agenda, because uh, we are extremely like-minded between Indonesia and uh, Germany. Now, what are the what are the main um, uh, the main um, um, uh, fields of our portfolio on the bilateral um, on the bilateral agenda? I would say. Um, we have, um, of course, a big emphasis on, um, on, um, on trade and commerce and economic cooperation. 
um, we have a big uh, chamber of commerce uh, in Indonesia with about three to four hundred companies that are in the German Indonesian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so there is a big uh, uh, traditional uh, commercial and trade presence and manufacturing presence of German big German companies. Almost everybody is here from Siemens to the big pharmaceutical institutes, BASF, Bayer, uh, to name just a few, uh, SAP. Um, we would like to have a little bit more share in the automotive sector, but uh, we are with uh, envy uh, seeing what our, our Japanese and uh, Korean uh, friends are, are, are doing here. But uh, if, if anybody has an idea of how we can uh, get more uh, Volkswagens and, um, and uh, BMWs and so on to Indonesia, we are very grateful <laughs> and you win a prize. <laughs> but um, so that's, that's very important, obviously. Um, the second uh, big field, I would say, for us is um, we are um, heavily involved, and I, I may, may I just emphasize this because this is something that I find always people uh, in Indonesia quite surprised by this. You know, when when um, when Indonesia became a lower middle income country, most of the bilateral development assistance donors left Indonesia. Now we are one of the few bilateral donors who has stayed, uh, and actually we have stayed with a substantial portfolio. We have a portfolio of about 5 billion, I repeat, 5 billion euros. You may put your, go to your calculator and see how many zeros in rupees this, uh, <laughs> this makes. 5 billion euros is a lot of money that we spend uh, in development assistance in Indonesia. Uh, the main um, fields of cooperation and development are uh, sustainability, energy, um, uh, waste, waste disposal, uh, waste, waste management, uh, uh, technical and educational training, um, uh, vocational training. So these are the the, the main the main objectives, and um, this brings me to, um, of course, the next uh, thing, which is we are also in political terms uh, very closely connected. We were together for two years on the Security Council of the United Nations as non permanent members, 2019 and twenty twenty just finished last, last year together, had a very close cooperation in that regard. We are, um, I think, extremely close in supporting Indonesia's regional aspirations. May I just mention here the South China Sea, where we support the legal position of um, the um, UN Convention of the Law of the Seas that Indonesia also shares, and we have made representations to that effect also to the United Nations in support of the Indonesian position and the position of other ASEAN countries. Um, we are, um, I think, um, heavily involved uh, in um, another field that is now more the concerns, more the global uh, agenda. Um, we have, um, I think we have three objectives, big objectives on the global agenda where we look at it as like-minded from Germany and Indonesia. The first is that we have to um, maintain our multilateral order. And that is why um, both Germany and Indonesia are part of what is called the Alliance for Multilateralism, which is a loose network of uh, about 40, 50 countries mainly um, in the context of the UN, who try to organize events and to advance the understanding of the importance of multilateral approaches to regional and international problems. This has been, I think, a direct answer to the Trump administration years uh, that are now behind us. Uh, but we have seen how fragile everything becomes if, um, if uh, important international actors put openly into question the multilateral order that has uh, proved to be quite helpful over the last 70 years to, to, um, to um, open possibilities of uh, management of uh, conflicts, of uh, regional disputes, of global uh, questions and so on. Uh, so uh, that, is, that is very important. And we are, I think, as Germany and Indonesia, very, very close in this regard. The second is, um, um, I would say, is the defense of democracy. Um, you know, Indonesia is the third biggest democracy in the world after India and the US. If we count the population, Germany is the biggest country in, uh, in the European Union. The European Union has about uh, 450 million uh, citizens. Um, uh, and uh, so we have big, I mean, Indonesia is a big country with 270 million. So we have big countries who are, um, of course, um, uh, called to um, defend democracy at a time 
where authoritarianism more and more uh, gains ground around the world. And um, I think it is very, very encouraging uh, for, for us to see the active civil society in Indonesia. And uh, one of the objectives of our embassy is not only to promote the government to government, G2G, what we call relations, but also to work to advance the relationship between the civil society organizations, the NGOs, and so forth. So that is very important. And the third issue, I think, uh, global issue that we we um, we hopefully work together, and there is still, I think, room for improvement, is uh, saving the planet. Um, this is at the moment, of course, at the forefront of any op-ed that you read in the international media. You know that. Um, uh, the urgency uh, of the climate situation is becoming uh, more acute. Um, the pandemic, actually, the COVID pandemic, uh, on which I will say uh, one word at the end, um, the COVID pandemic has, um, I think, highlighted the uh, fact that uh, there are a number of time bombs ticking. And the pandemic is uh, maybe uh, was uh, a terrible thing for all of us, but it's part of a bigger problem that has to do with the fact that the way we live, our globalization makes us um, also vulnerable and contains risks. The way we destroy biodiversity uh, puts species in a narrow space, thereby making it more likely that viral transmissions of species are sort of interchanged between species and we are also species you know plus if you take to this the global warming that we see ticking by the order and i mean uh, I, I i'm reading uh, regularly at the german magazine der spiegel and they have a wonderful thing every day where they just show you the number of co2 emissions in tons that we are still allowed to emit uh, in order to uh, contain the, world, the, the, the global temperature at 1.5 degree, the global rise in temperature by 1.5 degrees. And I mean, if you see this clock ticking, um, you, you become aware that, uh, that we really have to change our, complete, completely change our attitude and really put climate protection and the uh, uh, protection of our planet at the very forefront of our agendas. Now, one of the, I think, very heartening um, things that we see at the moment is that there is a general drive to more commitment. Uh, we have um, big countries who have a very clear decarb decarbonization or net zero agenda to of, of carbon neutrality. That means not to emit more uh, carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, we in, in Europe have the so-called Green Deal, which has been adopted under the von der Leyen Commission, which is a very, I think, important uh, signal to the world. Now, the U.S. administration has committed uh, spectacularly under President Biden to do the same. We see uh, similar uh, strategies in big countries like Korea, in Japan, and also in China. And um, uh, I think what we would like to discuss with our friends in Indonesia of how, how we could share experience and also support Indonesia in finding its own way to uh, decarbon the economy. I mean, we all know that coal uh, mining is an important part of uh, the uh, energy um, supply in Indonesia. It is still the fossil fuels are still the main uh, sources of energy used in this country. Um, but of course, you know, there is huge business also waiting outside with the introduction of new technologies for renewable energies. And Indonesia, of course, is a country blessed with a multitude of, of renewable energies. So, I mean, there are technical solutions. And I think it's important to establish the commercial and regulatory context to really make it interesting for investors to have a win-win situation, i.e., on the one hand, to... to um, to reach an energy supply which is based on renewable energy mainly and therefore uh, is a big contribution of a big country. Indonesia is a big country. It's a relevant systemic country in the world uh, to, to um, uh, limit um, uh, the rise of uh, global temperature and to reduce emissions. On the other hand, I think it's a huge business opportunity to turn into a green economy and there are many, many solutions and many, many investors also from, from, from other parts of the world who would be lined up to, to, to help. So that is, I think, um, uh, a big uh, momentum at the moment. We have the, the COP22, the 22nd Conference of Parties of the Climate Convention in Glasgow at the end of this year. So there is a lot of momentum. And Indonesia next year has the G20 presidency. So um, I think there's also some 
um, I think, interest that I feel in this country, in the government, how we can um, work together to advance this agenda. Uh, finally, let me say one word about uh, the pandemic, uh, because you, I, I cannot skip this topic. Um, and may I say that, uh, first of all, my condolences to all the families in Indonesia who have lost uh, loved ones uh, in, the, in the pandemic. Um, we in Germany, uh, we've discussed it briefly between the two of us before the opening of, of this conference. Uh, we in Germany are going through a hard time. Uh, we have had a third wave, which was really hard. We also have the problem, of course, in Europe that we have a different clim climatic situation. I mean, we have uh, from, let's say, October to March, April, we have winter, people are inside, there is limited opportunities to live outside. So the danger of, of course, transmission is much higher in, in inside than outside. And uh, so expectedly, uh, the third wave has uh, hit us quite hardly also with the, with the mutants. We have now plateaued and reducing a little bit and also we have now um, um, uh, we are on the way to vaccinate more people and uh, we think that by the summer we will hopefully be through the worst um, one thing that i would like to say here uh, in this to also to this audience is that um, it is sometimes a bit um, and i would be frank about this and i hope you don't mind it's sometimes a bit frustrating to see the way uh, Europe's contribution to the pandemic is commented on. I mean, there is this discussion about vaccine nationalism and so on. And of course, Europe had its own problems in getting the vaccination going. But I mean, I, I am a bit irritated by comments that uh, reproach the EU to be uh, one of the vaccine nationalism uh, vectors. I remind you that um, from the very start of the pandemic, back in last spring, uh, the European Union, France, Germany, Japan, and a number of other big countries have committed that to the, to the principle that nobody is safe until everybody is safe globally. And that is why those countries have, in beginning of May, launched a campaign to fundraise for what is called the COVAX facility, which is now quite successfully working and supplying poorer countries in the world with, with vaccines. Uh, of which, by the way, uh, your foreign minister, Ibu Retno, is the co-chair now. Um, we have been quite alone at the beginning when we were demarching and uh, promoting this agenda together with WHO and with the Gavi Alliance in Geneva. And it took a lot of effort to convince everybody that this is very important. And we in Germany and France also, we have put uh, 2.5 billion euros, Germany alone, France, 2.5 billion, the European uh, Union, 2.5 billion. So we have put 7.5 billion euros at the very beginning, beginning of May on the table to have the funds to start procuring vaccines at a time when they were not even available, when they were still in, in operation, in, in, in the in development phase. We have then at, a, at, a, at another pledging conference in, in September, October, Germany has put another 2.3 billion on top of that. Uh, the whole COVAX facility that is there to ensure supply worldwide for countries who don't have the funds to procure like we can do that, uh, is financed by 78% by G7 countries, by the G7 countries. So please take a break when you talk about vaccine nationalism. Um, and, and, you know, there are those who, who, who travel around with the vaccine diplomacy and who use also the vaccine diplomacy as a means to advance their strategic position in the world. We don't do that. We have also committed in Europe from the very start that we would export any excess vaccines that we would have and we will do so, something which other big actors uh, have, have not done the same way. And I'm speaking about Western big countries, you know, so... Um, I think when it comes now to, to, to analyzing this, um, this problem of access to vaccines, um, I would just plead to everybody to be a little bit fair and, uh, and, and pay some justice to um, the fact that everybody is coping with uh, this pandemic at home. So we have societies and, and populations we have who, have who expect us as governments to respond to their needs. And secondly, we have an international... Uh, commitment. And of course, we have this always had go hand in hand in, in, in Germany and Europe. And so uh, let me assure our viewers that uh, the European Union and Germany will continue to be staunch supporters of COVAX and other forms of 
uh, international cooperation in the supply of vaccines that are very important to us. So I think with these few words, maybe I, I leave it there. There are, uh, of course, I could go on for, for hours if you want, but our time is limited and maybe it's more interesting now to listen to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your presentation. Uh, of course, our hearts and thoughts goes to the people who are uh, affected by the pandemic. And uh, we know that it is a trying uh, time for uh, many people, uh, this pandemic. <clears throat> and we also thank you for explaining to us about the friendship of Germany to Indonesia. It's uh, the Germany position in the world affairs, the global issue that we are facing right now, and also uh, Germany's uh, commitment to net zero emission, and also the development of vaccine. We thank you for that, Ambassador. And uh, uh, Ambassador, right now we have uh, been joined by hundreds of students uh, from uh, all across Indonesia. Uh, we have uh, questions from Makassar, from Jakarta, from Bandung, from Surabaya, Cilacap even. And uh, uh, we would like to dive in and go ahead to our question and answer session right now. Uh, before uh, we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to encourage everyone uh, in our YouTube channel to uh, ask as many questions as possible to Ambassador, and we will try to uh, answer all the questions from the audience. Please remember, ladies and gentlemen, to state your name and affiliation before submitting your question. Uh, all right, uh, our first question, Ambassador Stuf. Uh, it is uh, from Fanny uh, from Makassar. Good morning, Ambassador. Uh, I want to know about Oktoberfest. Uh, what is uh, the people celebrating on October fast? And is it true that it takes uh, around full month, Ambassador? Thank you. <laughs> Are we collecting or should I answer right away? Answer right away, Ambassador. Okay, one well, the Oktoberfest is a, is, a, is a local um, celebration. It is um, in the south of Germany, taking place in the city of Munich. Uh, it has a, a long tradition. It's, I think, last, I'm not from Bavaria, so I, um, this may be also a hint for those who are guessing on the affiliation in football that I have. Uh, um, um, it is a local feast in October that has to do with a number of uh, celebrations that stem from the centuries back way, where, because October was the month of harvest, you know, when you harvest the crops. And many regions in Germany have different forms of, uh, of celebrations um, uh, of different kinds um, uh, around that uh, the season of the year. And uh, the Oktoberfest is a, is a big international <laughs> event now. There is a huge tent. Um, I must um, admit a terrible thing to you, uh, a really terrible thing. And I'm really, really, really very, very, very embarrassed for it. And I apologize. I personally have never been to the Oktoberfest. But I'm told it's a wonderful thing, even if you, especially if you'd like to drink beer. I warn you, the Bavarian beer is uh, strong. So, and the, the glasses are very big. Uh, so um, be careful and, uh, and uh, uh, restrain yourself. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope that this pandemic will get over soon so we can uh, visit Germany to uh, celebrate Oktoberfest with the Germans. Okay, Ambassador, now we have uh, another question from Ricky Leong. Uh, good morning, Ambassador. Uh, may I know when can we get appointment to apply for German visa? Uh, because I have an invitation letters from university in Germany, but I cannot apply for visa in this current situation. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, that's a very good question. Um, that also uh, gives me the opportunity to explain a little bit about our current situation. Uh, first of all, I think we are very happy that um, while the European Union has still a general policy of um, in the restrictions due to the pandemic, we have in Germany and in other European countries managed to exempt students who have a um, who want to study in Germany from that restriction. So, in principle, this is possible. We have of uh, I can only advise you to go to our website of the embassy. You can have an online registration there for an appointment. Um, now, I know from my colleagues that it's not easy at the moment to do that. It's a bit more complicated. And I ask for your understanding. Why do I do this? You know, we have uh, instructions from our authorities in Germany that due to the pandemic, we have to reduce our presence, our staff present in the premises of the embassy. Mm -hmm. That is a guideline that we have to follow. And that brings it about it that, um, you know, there are colleagues in the visa sections who have to do, first of all, to to um, uh, service clients who are there. 
Secondly, they have to take the telephone and it makes the job more difficult. So um, don't be frustrated. You will get an appointment. It will take more time than usual. And I just for ask for your understanding that also we have a responsibility to protect our colleagues and to reduce our presence in the embassy, like I think is done in many, many institutions and offices and companies also in Indonesia. We are not different. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Enrique, I hope that answered your question. Now uh, we have a question, Ambassador, from Central Java. This question comes from Diki. Uh, Ambassador, Germany and technology, both seems inseparable. Uh, how can the German government encourage industrial and technological progress and uh, discipline for every citizen? And uh, if I may add, uh, what cities, Ambassador, uh, are uh, the center of the industrial and technological uh, 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 center in the Germany. Can you can you repeat the last part of the question? I didn't acoustically understand it. Uh, could you identify which city is the center of technological and industrial center in Germany, Ambassador? Okay, now that's a very that's a very good question. Um, first of all, this is a good question because it gives me the opportunity to highlight one thing that I did not mention in my brief presentation. Uh, you know, we have um, in Germany um, every year we have what is the biggest um, manufacturing technology fair in the world, which is the Hannover Messe, Hannover Fair, Hannover Manufacturing Fair. It's the biggest manufacturing fair worldwide where the biggest technology developers come and, uh, and uh, showcase uh, uh, what they, all the innovations. Uh, it's also a big opportunity for business contracts. And, uh, and every year it has a partner country. So in 2020, we had the partner country, Indonesia, for the second time, by the way, because I think in the 80s already once Indonesia was a partner country of Hannover Fair. Now then the pandemic hit and we had to cancel Hannover Fair in 2020. We have just a week ago or two weeks ago, uh, finished the Hannover Fair, the first ever Hannover manufacturing fair in a digital online format with Indonesia as a partner country very successfully. And we will, because the digital um, way of organizing it puts certain limits, we have agreed together with Indonesia and Hannover, Me Hannover Messe that we will have a full presence partners, partner, partners country status again in 2023. So we are in a whole um, uh, path on, on, on expanding our cooperation between Indonesia and, uh, and Germany on this. And I think if you look at the, the, the main um, the main um, trends in technology manufacturing, it's all, and I say it again, it's all uh, uh, in, in, green, in green manufacturing and in, in renewable energy. And again, this is wonderful that Indonesia uh, could be, uh, can be a partner country uh, also in 2023. Now, as far as the city is concerned, that's a very interesting question which um, also um, allows me to point to a feature of my country, which I maybe should have mentioned at the, at the introduction. Uh, unlike um, France, where there is Paris, or the UK, where there is London, or Spain, where there's Madrid, or Italy, where there's Milano, in Germany, you don't have this one center. Um, we have, of course, different poles of manufacturing. I think it is, in general, more in the south of Germany, in the state of Baden-Württemberg, in the, in the Stuttgart area, you find, for example, Daimler. In Munich, you have Siemens. Uh, in um, in um, uh, Ingolstadt, in the south, which is a city north of uh, Germany, you have, you have Audi. But in the north, in Wolfsburg, close to Hannover, you have Volkswagen. <laughs> so um, in innovation, uh, and that is, of course, um, for us uh, more and more important because, you know, there are so many people in the world who can manufacture well. And the difference, the technological advantage that we have in Germany stems from our capacity and ability to really develop you know, innovate, innovation solutions. I think there you cannot point to one city. You have many, many, many universities, research institutions, a huge startup community, which is spread throughout uh, Germany without it making possible to name any city center or any city, um, uh, especially also in, the, in East Germany, uh, there you find, uh, you find very, very powerful and, and very good uh, uh, poles of innovation. Um, uh, and um, it is, um, it is uh, really not possible to point to, to, to one city. I mean, this is, we are a federal country uh, with 16 states. 
and the competence of government action is distributed between the federal government in Berlin and the state governments and the 16 state governments and um, uh, research and so on is the universities are run by the states, for example, uh, research institutions very often are mixed animals between the federal government, the state governments and a lot of private enterprises. So there's a, a public private partnerships, a lot of PPPs. And, um, and there is a healthy competition also between the regions to attract um, uh, researchers and innovation and so on. But research innovation is really um, more important than, than, than ever before. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we have another question from uh, Nurul from Chilachap, Central Java. Ambassador, Germany is my favorite country. I always want to continue my study there. Uh, I would like to ask you, what is Germany's uh, cur currently doing to help with their environmental issues? Dank. With, with the environmental issues, okay. Uh, well, I think that Germany was the first country in Europe to, uh, in, in 1998, uh, 1999 or 2000, to um, establish a so-called renewable energy law. Uh, this was under a government where the Green Party had an important role to play um, in, the, in the late 90s and early, early 2000s. Uh, so the energy turnaround, which means to, to try to turn, around, turn away from both fossil fuels and also nuclear energy, because we are a country which is phasing out, uh, I think, in two years, the last nuclear plant that, uh, that we have. Um, but we also made a commitment, and this is a big, big challenge, to phase out coal production by 2034 in the framework of our net zero strategy. And um, so I think this is at the moment one of the biggest challenges that we, that we have. It is also one of the most discussed issue, how you can combine, on the one hand, um, uh, the objective of an economy that is fossil fuel free and carbon neutral, but on the other hand, to which also maintains the competitiveness of our industry. And there are, I mean, uh, difficult discussions. And uh, I think if you want to be serious about this um, uh, net zero strategies and uh, these uh, carbon neutrality strategies, I think it is not um, a wise idea to ignore that there are, of course, um, contradictory interests that you have to somehow bring into uh, some kind of coherence. Um, we are convinced that um, the turnaround to a green economy is a huge opportunity to um, create jobs. Uh, actually, uh, there are many studies who show that the turnaround to a green economy, there was, I think, recently a study of, of one of the big uh, consultancy firms, McKinsey or Boston Consulting, which showed that actually the net effect on the job market of the turn, turn, of a turn to a green economy is positive rather than negative. You win jobs. But under one condition, of course, you have to accompany the whole turnaround process through appropriate skills training. And that is why uh, also when you look at Indonesia, it is very important with your, big, um, uh, with your big population and also your big labor force, if you want to do that and you, to avoid big social problems, that um, as uh, Padjokovi, the president, has rightly put it on the top of the agenda for his second legislature, that you have to invest in human capital and vocation and technical education is key in order to train people in these new fields of megatronic um, and so on. So there is a, I mean, I think the whole challenge of the environment is closely linked to the challenge of human, develop, human capital development and other fields. But if you do it right, in the balance, it will be a win-win situation. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Now we have a question from Jason, who is a student at Multimedia Nusantara University. As the leading member of the EU, how does Germany view its relations with Indonesia and ASEAN? Is it already at the level it hoped to be, Ambassador? Well, I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, um, First of all, between Germany and Indonesia, we have, since 2012, uh, something that we call a strategic partnership between our two countries. Uh, and in the strategic partnership, we have a number of um, 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 uh, priority areas. Um, one is, um, of course, uh, 
um, I mean, some of the areas I mentioned before, but for example, there is a very important issue called the, the, the cooperation in maritime affairs. And we have lots of contacts with the Ministry of Paluhut, um, and he is often in Germany, uh, where we look at all the aspects of uh, maritime affairs, specifically connectivity, uh, port development, uh, shipbuilding, uh, logistics, and so on. So that is um, that is uh, the strategic partnership between Indonesia and Germany. And also a second part of this is, of course, as I mentioned before, the technical and vocational education part. So these are the two landmarks, I would say, of this cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, the I think what we have seen in the last years is a new era, era in terms of EU-ASEAN relations. You know, it was odd that um, the bloc who is the biggest investor in ASEAN, in the ASEAN region, investor, has not been able to be granted the status of a strategic partner of ASEAN until last year. Um, now, this had to do with a number of um, difficult issues, um, um, specifically in the area of vegetable oils, I don't have to say more. Uh, which we were able to overcome under, I'm very proud to say, under German EU presidency last year, uh, where we have agreed with, uh, with the relevant actors on the ASEAN side to, um, uh, to manage these, uh, these, these discussions in a, in a reasonable way, um, so that it is not something that blocks um, the entry into force of the strategic partnership between the European Union and, um, and uh, ASEAN. Um, for us, um, if I may say so, uh, from the European po Union point of view, ASEAN is a um, extremely relevant and central actor. I think as Indonesia and actually as ASEAN, we are um, concerned about a bipolar world where countries and governments are obliged in one way or the other to make choices. We would maintain the, um, the, the we, would, we would plea for a situation where um, countries or groups of countries can act in a free multilateral world where there are a number of uh, partners available for, to do different things in a multilateral spirit and where you are not forced to, 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 to force, uh, to force uh, countries into one camp or the other. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have to be explicit about this. Now, in this way, you, Europe and ASEAN are in a very similar situation. Uh, we both want to maintain our place in this uh, situation, which has now become maybe a little bit attenuated with the, with, the, with, the, with the new administration in Washington, but we both want to be in a world where we are not uh, uh, forced or blackmailed to commit to one or the other side, but we want to be free and we want to uh, have uh, independent free partnerships in the spirit of multilateralism with as many countries and as many actors in the world as possible. And that is why the European Union and ASEAN share here a common interest. Um, also, I think um, I'm very proud to say that the European Union now is in the process of devising a new strategy for the Indo-Pacific. Um, and this is a, a new thing. You know that um, uh, ASEAN in 2019, uh, under the, I think under the, I would say under the guidance and leadership of the Indonesian government, Pajokovi and Ibu Retno has um, managed to agree, to make ASEAN agree on a joint um, outlook on the Indo-Pacific, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which actually is guided by the principle of inclusiveness of cooperation and not guided on the principle of containment. Um, we in Germany have last year uh, published our own Indo-Pacific strategy, and we have, under our presidency in the European Union in the second semester of 2020, successfully brought the European Union uh, to agree as a bloc to devise a comprehensive Indo-Pacific strategy of the European Union. So we have tried to give an impulse to the discussion within Europe to become active here. And if you, if you will read the, um, the first um, 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 general guidelines and principles of what that strategy will look like, you will find a lot of ASEAN in there. And you will find a lot of uh, commitment to the centrality of ASEAN there. 
and you will see also a shared view that uh, the region, the Indo-Pacific region, should be guided by the principle of uh, inclusiveness, of course, on the basis of a normative, of certain norms and rules, of a rules-based order, uh, not on the, on, the, um, uh, on the basis of force, of containment. So um, I think there is a whole new chapter waiting for us in the relationship between the European Union and ASEAN. And uh, as I said, um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a very dynamic discussion and uh, I am very happy to be here at a time when this takes place because uh, you know, there are many people in Europe who have still have to discover ASEAN. Uh, we have to do a lot more in Europe uh, to explain what ASEAN is about, because you know there is a there, there there are two reflexes that I find both in Europe and in ASEAN. If you're here and uh, you speak to people about the European Union, the main thing is you are very complicated. Who is who? Who is the Commission? Then you have the governments and the presidency, and then uh, trade. Why is trade? Why can I do trade policy directly with Germany? Why is it the uh, EU? Okay, it is very complicated, but it is complicated for a good reason. And as I said in my introduction, in Europe, we have been through terrible uh, wars in the, in the 20th century. And the fact that many, many policy areas are now integrated is a good thing, is a very positive thing, is an extremely happy thing for all of us and for the world, I might say so. Um, but of course, you know, if you want to get 27 member states to agree, it's not easy. You see in, in, in countries like Indonesia and in, in Germany with 16 states, how um, what effort you have to invest in to bring about a consensus, you know. And if I look at Europe and the way they look at ASEAN, it's a little bit like um, they don't understand ASEAN because uh, they, don't, they, they think that ASEAN is the kind of the EU of, of Asia. And of course, it's not the EU because it has a completely different tradition, back, different background, different legal basis, the different treaty. Uh, it is not supranational like the EU. It is an intergovernmental um, uh, effort. Um, and I have so much explaining to do in Germany and Europe, explaining to people what ASEAN is, is about. Uh, but at the same time, we see so much um, spontaneous interest in each other. Because, you know, although ASEAN is not an integrated uh, bloc as Europe, I mean, there are many, many issues that I think are interested to, to learn about because it is in the interest also of each and every ASEAN state uh, to maybe see to it how it can efficiently increase cooperation among each other. Maybe also in some areas to create some kind of joint initiatives. You have now the AHA Center, for example, for humanitarian affairs. It's a good example, like what we call ECHO in, in Europe, you know. So humanitarian affairs is something you can do together. Maybe customs policy is something you can do together. You know, lots of things in, 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 in connectivity you can do together. Um, so, I mean, there are, although we are different animals, there is still a lot of... Um, exchange possible and a lot of discussion should take place about how you and we do things and uh, increase our cooperation. So it has been a bit lengthy, the answer, but I think it's a, it's a whole special field, the EU-ASEAN EU relations, but uh, I think we are now at the peak of our, of our relation and never has it been so intense and, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to see that. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive uh, answer, Ambassador. And of course, with the new partnership between EU and ASEAN, we hope that uh, the cooperation will be stronger and we uh, hope to see uh, better collaboration between EU and uh, ASEAN. And of course, we also thank you, Ambassador, because not only you become the ambassador of Germany to Indonesia, but you're the informal ambassador of ASEAN region to explain what is ASEAN to back home, right? <laughs> okay, Ambassador. Uh, now we have a question uh, from Dennis, uh, who come from Bandung, Ambassador. Uh, ambassador, is this your first time being posted in Indonesia? And when you first lived in Indonesia, did you have any difficulties to adapt to the culture? Thank you. Okay, uh, this is my first time uh, in Indonesia. I came in 2018 um, um, and um, I have been working well, as a young man. I worked for the United Nations in, in Asia, but in a different part of Asia, in South Asia, in Pakistan, uh, where I worked for the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees before becoming a German diplomat. So this is my knowledge about Asia. 
I have spent most of my, my, my professional career in Europe. I was eight years in Brussels working at the German representation of the, to the European Union. And in Berlin, I have been eight years also director of uh, European Union affairs. So, I mean, that is um, uh, for me, um, uh, 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 well, I, I would say a new experience. The second part of the question is, um, I must say that I found um, uh, arriving in Indonesia, I was overwhelmed by the hospitality. I was overwhelmed by the good food. I was overwhelmed by the friendliness of the people. I was also overwhelmed by the openness of the society, by the extreme, by the by the extremely developed uh, curiosity about uh, issues, about Germany, about Europe, about uh, um, uh, thematical uh, uh, issues like environment, climate policy, sustainability, uh, human rights. So I, I must say my experience experience in Indonesia has been exclusively positive. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, now we have a question from Maria Citra, who is from Pontianak, uh, West Kalimantan, Ambassador. Uh, I want to know how to apply for scholarships for students outside Germany. Uh, for your information, Ambassador, we also do uh, virtual talks on Erasmus Plus scholarship uh, here at FPCI every month. Um, maybe if there's other channels for uh, Maria to apply for a scholarship ambassador, uh, please uh, explain. Yes, um, I mean, we, have, um, we are very lucky to have in Indonesia <clears throat> the presence of the German Academic Exchange Service, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is the central German organization worldwide uh, providing scholarships for students in Germany, but also for, for Germans to go abroad. Uh, there are various there are various um, kinds of scholarships. There is a there is a language program, of course, that uh, in, enables uh, students to learn German in Germany, uh, and of course there are uh, there are scholarships for uh, for degrees in subjects where you can have a full fledged uh, degree program in uh, Germany. Um, the um, um, you know I'm I'm trying very hard in 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 Indonesia to promote uh, our um, uh, university landscape in Germany. Um, I know that LDPD has a list of, uh, of countries and universities that uh, it selects to send <clears throat> people to. And I must admit that sometimes I find German universities a little bit underrepresented uh, in that. Um, there, is, uh, there are these international rankings, which, uh, okay, put always the Harvards and the Oxfords at the top of the list. But I mean, don't forget that uh, your former president, uh, Habibi, he was the, one of the greatest engineers of this country, and he studied in, uh, in Aachen and in Munich in Germany, and uh, so um, uh, there are a number of very good universities. Now, we have, um, in a few countries, we have offices of the German Academic Exchange Service. We have one here, and I would, um, I would advise you to direct you to the um, office of the German Academic Exchange Service here in Jakarta. You can, I think, find it easily on the internet, or you can also find it uh, through our websites of the embassy uh, for further directions. But um, of course, I must add that at the moment, uh, due to the pandemic, everything is limited. I mean, there are not as many, as many, as not as much student mobility as we would wish for. Um, but we hope to, to go back to this to normal as soon as possible. And uh, one uh, thing also is very good in Germany. Um, you know, it is one of the few countries where university education is, uh, well, I wouldn't say cost free, but the tuition is extremely low. And the universities are excellent. Thank you, Ambassador. We have a question from Grecia. Uh, Ambassador Skouf, uh, I hope you are doing well. Ambassador, could you tell us a bit about OPIR? And how is the development of, of OPIR in the current pandemic era, Ambassador? Thank you. The development of what? Sorry, I didn't. OPIR program. OPIR, Ambassador? OPIR. Ah, OPIR. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, <laughs> yes. Well, that is, um, I mean, unfortunately, this is, this is uh, uh, difficult because uh, I think um, I, am, I must admit that um, the situation on the OPIR market has been quite fluid for a long time. There was no possibility for au pair visas uh, from, uh, from Indonesia. Um, I have to admit that I have to look into that and I would uh, advise uh, the viewer to maybe um, uh, contact um, online or write, write a mail to, to just our embassy. Can you tell me the name of the, of the 
person who asked the question so I can make sure that her question is, is, is directed properly? It's Gracia, Ambassador. Gracia. Okay, Gracia. I will um, please write, uh, if, if you go to our website, you find a general inquiry uh, email form. Write an email to the embassy. I will uh, communicate to my people when they see an email with your name that they attend to this immediately and you get a reply because I have to look into it what the current situation for au pairs really is. Okay, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and uh, for that uh, response also. Now we have a question from Ferry FND, who is working at a startup uh, work. Uh, who, that is uh, in the nurse labor market, Ambassador. Uh, Which market in? Nurse labor market. Nurse so labor market. Yeah. So he's applying nurses to uh, ah, okay. health ambassador. Yeah. Uh, is there any chance for a program? Uh, is there any chance or program to collaborate with, with German uh, regarding uh, the placement of Indonesian nurses in German healthcare market, Ambassador? Yes, well, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we have a new law in Germany since two years, which is uh, trying to um, to enable um, regular labor market migration in fields where there are shortages of labor in uh, in, in Germany, and uh, the nursing sector is one of them. Um, there are a number of organizations in Germany who are engaged in this. Um, we are in the lift off phase of this program still, I must admit. So there is, uh, there are still some possibilities, but in general, I would say there are possibilities for placement and we are, as we are good Germans trying to do everything right and correct and orderly, we take our time to, to devise our rules. And that is where we are at the moment, but in, in the, in the middle perspective, uh, there is there are opportunities and there is an interest on the German side also to have such placements. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we have a question from Fatima, who is from Padang. Uh, hello, Ambassador. I wonder if you know a German Netflix series titled Dark. I really like that show. <laughs> In the series, there is a catastrophe caused by nuclear disaster. My question, Ambassador, how is Germany manage their nuclear resources? Thank you. Nuclear resources. Yeah. Okay. She's okay. referring to uh, yeah. And what was the name of the of the Netflix series? Dark Ambassador. Dark. Okay. 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 There are a num number of very good uh, Netflix series, German Netflix series that I've seen. This one I will I will see on Netflix what it is about. Now we have um, been, as I said in my introduction, one of the first countries in Europe who have uh, we have committed to phase out nuclear energy. Um, there is, of course, the debate that, on the one hand, nuclear energy is very clean. So it's, uh, it's uh, undisputedly um, net zero emissions. Um, but on the other hand, um, we think it is irresponsible to develop nuclear, nuclear energy at a, at a time when they, we have no adequate solutions for the storage of nuclear waste. And the nuclear waste that is produced is going to uh, have uh, radiation, um, uh, radiation for centuries. And uh, the uh, technical solutions, um, how to do that, are, I would say, still not clear fully. Uh, we in Germany uh, are still in the process of having a final decision of a nuclear waste uh, storage uh, lo lo local locality. Uh, some people say if you dig it very deep, like hundreds of meters deep into salt stocks, that is a safe way. But on the other hand, there are also scientists who say that this is also not safe. And I mean, there, if we see it around the world, what is happening to nuclear waste, uh, this is not very encouraging because uh, uh, quite a few um, countries or companies who uh, are involved in nuclear energy um, they have uh, nuclear waste disposal practices that are quite dangerous. So we try to do our, our energy turnaround without fossil fuels and without nuclear. Uh, it's a big challenge. It's a bigger challenge than for those who still are committed to nuclear energy. But again, we think it can be done and we hope to be successful latest by 2050. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we have a question from Iqbal, who is a member of FTCI chapter Universitas Hasanuddin from Makassar. Uh, 
how actually football has influenced the social life of German people, Ambassador? How big is the industry in Germany? Since you already mentioned that football is already something big uh, to the life of people of Germany. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, this is a, this is a, a, a very deep question uh, with many, many layers. I mean, first of all, in German families, you grow up with a team. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will now say it, when I was uh, six years old, my grandfather, he was from the city of Dortmund. And my first experience uh, with football was when he took me by the hand and we watched a match by Borussia Dortmund. And this was in 1961. <laughs> um, and that has stayed for me with me forever. So it's like uh, you're, you're like breastfeeding. You know, you you grow up with a with a country that you're affiliated with, and uh, you go with this country through through thick and thin, as we say in German, uh, bad times, good times, and so on. So um, 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 now, um, football is still by far the the, the biggest uh, sport, uh, the biggest sport in the sport industry in Germany. Um, it is uh, the Bundesliga is a brand that is well known internationally. Um, it is also broadcast live on some of the media here in Indonesia every Saturday, as I as I noticed with uh, with uh, great sympathy. Um, of course, football <clears throat> has its own issues. <clears throat> you know, when I grew up, there were teams, and uh, the players of the teams they were from that city. So the, the players from Borussia Dortmund, they were from Dortmund. The players from Bayern Munich, they were from Munich. The players from Hamburg ISV, they were from Hamburg, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, if you now watch the Bundesliga match, you will see by the names uh, and also by the physiognomy that this is no longer the case. Football has, has become a, a big profit, um, profit uh, um, enterprise, um, where on the one hand, of course, the, the radiation I mean the sort of the 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 the, the um, not the, how shall I say the the influence on on the on the society has become bigger and bigger, um, um, but of course also money plays uh, a very big role now, and uh, uh, the main thing is to have um, uh, good investors. Now we in Germany in the Bundesliga we are very proud that we have still a law that prohibits, like uh, unlike in the Premier League in the. In, in, in the UK or in, uh, in Spain uh, that prohibits just investors to buy a club. That is impossible in Germany. You can have uh, investments up to a level of 50% and not more. There are some special arrangements for, for, for some teams, uh, but, but you can still see the, the, the amount of shares of a company or an investor in a, in a club is never as high as in, a, in, a, in, in other countries. So it's really a fan-driven uh, mm. national league still. Uh, which is which is very important. The second thing that I would like to mention is football is extremely important. Um, and I'm not talking now about the Bundesliga and the big names, but I'm talking about if you go to any German city and you go to the local football fields, it is the place where people meet. It's also a place where integration takes place, you know, mm -hmm. where people who are new in Germany, when the kids are starting to play football, you know, that is their way to get into German society, to find friends and to... To also learn German better and to know more, to learn more about Germany, and it's also a big, 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 um, uh, I would say, potential for advancement of of human rights and equality. Because you know the commitment to fight racism, xenophobia, for example. Very often you have these these shirts, you know, where the players openly commit that they fight racism and bad things in society. So I mean, it is uh, it reaches a lot of uh, a lot of people. It's a huge multiplier. And still, it's a wonderful sport. And we are very proud to be one of the leading countries still in the world, although, well, we still can do better. Hey, thank you, Ambassador. Mia Samia. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I have a question from Yuja, uh, Yuja Ramano from Bukit Tinggi, Ambassador. Um, the Brexit was a painful event. Is there any uh, strategy from the EU uh, to prevent any other Brexit-like events, Ambassador? Yeah. Uh, uh, Good question. The Brexit has been a very painful event. Um, uh, we um, are very sad to have lost the UK in the, as a partner of the European Union because we in Germany also have worked extremely well with our uh, UK colleagues. And as I said before, I, I worked eight years in Brussels and many years as EU director and I had excellent uh, colleagues in, in London uh, and in Brussels with whom we worked. And uh, 
um, you know, in the EU, of course, there are different traditions. You know, there is a tradition of more centralized government intervention on the one hand, and then there is the tradition of more market-oriented economies like you find in Northern Europe. And um, to, to us in Germany, the UK has been an extremely like-minded economy. Um, and also it, it's been a P5 uh, member of the Security Council of the Perm Permanent Five. So for the European Union, it is certainly a loss. Um, I think um, uh, for the UK, um, the verdict is out, but um, I warn people who are overly optimistic about the economic consequences of the Brexit for the UK. We will, we will see. Um, I think one of the things that I am really impressed about is that when I look back at the beginning of the discussion, and this is when, when I still worked in Europe, uh, there were so many concerns that this might trigger a wave of countries who think that Brussels is too almighty and uh, that, uh, that we have to go back to more, uh, well, I mean, Germany first, Poland first, France first, uh, Spain first policies, you know, and uh, that this might trigger a whole wave of devolution in the, in, the, in the EU. I am very impressed and happy to say that on the contrary, uh, I think one of the instant reflexes, which is, was overriding the tensions on many, many policy areas that you can sense if you are working in the European Union between the member states, was that um, there was a consensus that the biggest priority is that to contain this virus of Brexit, <laughs> if I may say so. And uh, we have actually managed to, to do that. Um, and we have worked collectively the commission with the chief negotiator, negotiator Michel Barnier, there has been no side agenda. Uh, there were, of course, tendencies in the UK to sort of play out different European member states against each other, to play out the commission uh, against uh, other EU bodies. This has not worked. On the contrary, we stayed together, we stood together. And uh, so while I fully stand by what I said before, that it is very regrettable to have lost the UK as a partner in the EU. I must say that, yes, of course, the EU has not been strengthened by this loss. But on the other hand, we have contained to, um, to trigger a wave of uh, devolution in the EU and the weakening of the EU. And uh, on the contrary, I think there has been a sense of, uh, a sense of solidarity in the EU. Uh, a corporate sense of belonging together uh, that uh, Brexit has actually strengthened. Okay, Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we have a question from Jason Irman from Venus University. Uh, how can Germany's democracy teach uh, Indonesia or become an inspiration to Indonesia to develop a more suitable governance, uh, Ambassador? Thank you. Well, you know, to this, this is a question to which I find it very difficult to reply. Uh, because each country uh, is different. Each country has its own path to democracy. Indonesia found its path to democracy, uh, reformasi, in a way which went also through their own catharsis. Uh, in a way, Germany went through catharsis. Um, um, I think um, I would be very hesitant to be in the teaching mode. You know, we in Europe are one of the experiences I made in the in the in the ASEAN region that one of of all the good things that Europe stands for and Europe is recognized for. Many people tell me that uh, we have to work a little bit on our uh, on the way we we um, communicate uh, in a, sometimes a too patronizing uh, way, and I take this I take this extremely serious. Um, but I mean, I am very happy to see that Indonesia is a very committed democracy. Uh, a very solid and stable democracy these days. I think we see all in all our countries at the moment we see threats to democracy. And uh, that is, I think, where it is indeed uh, important and helpful to maybe uh, look at each other and see what our mutual experiences are. We face an erosion uh, of democracy in Europe through authoritarianism. We have some member states where, well, I must say the rule of law is applied in a way which is hardly in line with the European uh, treaties. Uh, we see practices of populism in some European countries which are not in line with, a, not always in line with the norms and values of the, of the Treaty on European Union. Um, you see tendencies, of course, of authoritarianism in Asia, in Indonesia too. 
um, and we have to, uh, I think, uh, as I, because of what I said before, the three common um, global issues that we stand for, multilateralism, defense of democracy, and the, and the maintaining the, the planet, the defense of democracy is, is something that we both um, face um, in different ways, and the, the, the attacks on democracy are coming from different angles, maybe. But I think we are both here in the same situation, but certainly the German situation or the European situation is, is different than the Indonesian situation. Uh, so uh, I would be, I think this is, a, this is really a, a subject for a whole seminar that we, we could do and not for a short reply, but let me leave it there. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Now we are down to our last question, Ambassador. This question is from Ella from Jambi. Uh, what, is it, what is so special about the Europe Day, Ambassador? Uh, what does the, the Europe Day mean to you personally? And what do people of German usually do during the Europe Day? Thank you. Well, the Europe Day is a, is a very important day. It's the day of the Schumann Declaration, 1952. Uh, where um, basically the declaration on the establishment of the European Union was passed. Uh, for us Germans, it is very special and it brings me back to the very general remarks about my country I made at the beginning. You know, when Germany came out of the ruins of World War II, uh, and I am from the West, so I grew up in West Germany, uh, we became a divided country. The country lost its unity, divided into East Germany, occupied by, by the Soviet bloc, and West Germany, fortunately, being part of the free liberal Western world with a lot of help from the US and other Western powers. But, you know, my parents still told me how it felt to travel abroad uh, as a German after World War II and how we were looked at uh, and how bad uh, the events of the 20th century uh, influenced the image of my country. We had a number of uh, very great and wise statesmen in uh, France, in the UK, Winston Churchill, for example, that is why it is so sad to see the UK leave the European Union, who brought about this first idea about the European Union, who brought about the idea not to destroy Germany, but to bring it back into the community of civilized nations. And one of the big or the biggest vehicle to do this was the establishment of the European Union, of the European community at the time, where basically all we did was merge our coal and steel production in a common uh, market. Um, and um, for us, the European Union has been a way to reestablish Germany in the family of civilized and free nations. Without the European Union, this would have been maybe not impossible, but it would have been so much more difficult. And that is why Germany, I think more than any country in Europe is grateful and committed uh, to the European Union. And this is why we also as Germans feel a very special commitment to Europe Day. Okay. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the YouTube live chat uh, still have so many questions, but unfortunately due to the time constraints, we cannot take them all today. I would like to give a big thank you to Ambassador Peter Skoof for answering all of the questions today and to all of the audiences who have participated today. Uh, it was a very insightful discussion, Ambassador, and uh, I believe that all of us here have learned a lot today, uh, especially about Germany and the European Union. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we close, we have actually prepared a very fun quiz for all of our audiences today. And if you answer the question correctly and quickly, you will be receiving a goodie bag with cool gifts uh, and prizes. Uh, Ambassador Peter, uh, you are most welcome to stay, but you are also welcome if you have uh, to leave, if you have another agenda to attend after this, Ambassador. So Thank perhaps you very if, much. You uh, yeah, exactly. if you would like to deliver any closing statement, Ambassador? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed this uh, profoundly. I found the questions really insightful and, um, and, and, and uh, very interesting. And I was very happy to speak about Germany and Europe. And um, uh, please maintain your interest in, in Europe. Um, um, Indonesia and Europe have a lot to share, a lot still to develop in our mutual potential. Uh, there's a lot we can do together, and especially I like the questions of the, the, the students because um, 
um, we will do everything to um, strengthen also the mobility between students to learn more about each other, for you to learn about Germany and Europe, but also, frankly speaking, for Europeans, young Europeans and Germans to come to Indonesia and other ASEAN countries to learn about this region and to learn that Asia is not only about uh, China and Japan, but uh, and maybe K-pop, but there's also uh, much, much more to it and much more important uh, things to it. So thank you very much to all of you. It was a pleasure to talk to you and I wish you a good uh, good day and uh, next weekend, of course, a good uh, holiday. Yes, thank you very thank much, you. Ambassador. <laughs> Stay safe, Ambassador. And we love to have you as our speaker today and we hope to uh, see you again, Ambassador, at our future events. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for our quiz today, we will be using the platform Kahoot. Uh, it is very easy, ladies and gentlemen. So let me uh, read out the instructions before we start. Uh, please use a second screen or a second device and do not close your YouTube tab. To join the game, open another tab and go to www.kahoot.it. Make sure it is a .it, uh, India Tingo, not India Delta, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, enter the game pin, which is displayed on your screen, and the game pin for today is 612-0508. Once again, it's 612-0508. Please use your order confirmation number as your nickname, ladies and gentlemen. The order confirmation number can be found on your ticket that was sent to you to the email by Evan Bright. Uh, your order confirmation number should look like this, and in your email should look like this. And ladies and gentlemen, we highly suggest you to focus your attention on the uh, quiz instead of the YouTube live stream because uh, there might be a slight delay on YouTube. Uh, at the end of the good, uh, Kahoot quiz, ladies and gentlemen, there will be three winners that will get uh, prizes from the European Union. So uh, if, you won, if you are one of the winners, uh, please make sure to take a screenshot as proof of winning. Uh, lastly, please uh, contact our staff immediately after the quiz to claim your prizes uh, by sending a direct message to at FPCindo on Instagram, providing your uh, personal details and the screenshot of your uh, Kahoot winning. All right, uh, we'll be giving some time uh, to wait for more players to join Kahoot. Okay, once again, ladies and gentlemen, please go to kahoot.it and enter the game pin. And the game pin today is 612-0508. We now have uh, 45 people who have joined. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you again to use your order confirmation number, which you can find on your ticket as the nickname. Once again, your nickname should be the order confirmation number, which you can find on the email sent by Evan Bright. All right, we'll be waiting for uh, more people to join. I think uh, we're gonna start in one minute. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please your, use your order confirmation number, which you can find in your email as your nickname. All right, let us start the game. Our first question, what is the head of government in Germany called? Is it president? Is it prime minister? Is it chancellor? Is it counselor? And 18 people have answered correctly. We're moving to the second question. Germany has historically been uh, called the land of poets and... Is it artists? Is it scientists? Is it thinkers or musicians? Wow, yeah, 12 persons uh, answered correctly. We're moving to the third question. Which of these famous car manufacturers is not German? Is it BMW, 
Volkswagen, Audi, or Aston Martin. And 36 people answered correctly. We're halfway through our first question, ladies and gentlemen. What percentage of German Autobahn highway has no maximum speed limit? Is it 20%, 50%, 70%, or 100%? Yep, the answer is 70%. Our fifth question today. What is Germany and Indonesia's priority area of development cooperation? Is it renewable energy, environmental protection, vocational education, or all of the above? Yep, all are the right answer. Our sixth question, ladies and gentlemen. Around how many students in Indonesia teach the German language as a school subject? Is it 500, 1,000, 2,500, or 5,000? And the answer is 5,000. Our second to last question. Where could you find the German culture, language, and economy center, Wisma German? Is it in Jakarta, Bandung, Surabaya, or Bali? Our last question today, ladies and gentlemen. Which German ethnologist popularized the country name Indonesia? It's Adolf Bastian. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we have our three winners who have answered the Kahoot game quickly and correctly. Please, uh, I would like to once again uh, remind you to take a screenshot as your winning proof uh, for all of the three winners today. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our quiz and congratulations to all of the winners. Again, as a reminder, please contact us via our Instagram DM to claim your prizes. Kindly provide us with your name, address, uh, phone number, as well as the screenshot of your Kahoot uh, for verification uh, purposes. We finally have come to the end of our session today, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to thank Ambassador Peter Scoof for uh, the valuable time that he has given to us. And on behalf of FPCI, I would also like to extend our gratitude to the Embassy of Germany in Indonesia, uh, the delegation of the European Union to Indonesia, and to all of the audiences who have uh, tuned in live through our YouTube today. I would like to remind everyone that we still have another Ask Ambassador Anything sessions. Uh, that is part of the Europe Future Talks Road to Europe Day 2021. Uh, this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, His Excellency Lambert Prince, uh, Ambassador of the Netherlands to Indonesia at 2 p.m. And we also have a closing uh, ceremony uh, with His Excellency Ambassador uh, Vincent Piquet, Ambassador of the European Union to Indonesia, and a closing remark by Dr. Dino Patijalal, uh, Founder and Chairman of FPCI tomorrow at 10 p.m. So make sure to tune in uh, for those sessions as well, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, for more information and to register, please visit bit.ly slash talks. Once again, uh, I would like to thank you and hope to see you again at our future events. Happy Europe Day, everyone.